This is our ocean and our cryosphere, the frozen parts of the world. They shape our identities, our way of life. They sustain us and determine our future. But we are changing our planet in profound ways. Human-induced climate change is affecting the ocean and cryosphere and the way they support our lives, impacting our land use, industry, energy systems, urban areas, and infrastructure. In mountain regions, melting of glaciers and thaw are increasing hazards and threatening safe water supplies. Extreme events in coastal regions are becoming more severe. Melting glaciers and ice sheets are causing sea levels to rise. As our ocean absorbs heat and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, sea temperatures are rising and water chemistry is changing, threatening the marine life we depend on. The IPCC Special Report on the Ocean and Cryosphere in a Changing Climate presents the latest knowledge and opportunities to address the challenges we face today and in the future. We are starting to adapt to unavoidable changes. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions further protects our livelihoods. Together, we can build a sustainable and equitable future for all. Our future is in our hands. Good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this press conference of the IPCC to present the special report on the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate, which we completed, which we approved yesterday here in Monaco. I'd like to introduce the panel to you that will be presenting the, this report. So on, on my right, your left, is Abdullah Moxit, Secretary of the IPCC, Panmal Jai, Co-Chair of IPCC Working Group 1, Valerie Masson-Delmott, Co-Chair of Working Group 1, uh, Ko Barrett, IPCC Vice-Chair, Hui Sung Lee, Chair of the IPCC, Hans Otto Pertner, Co-Chair of IPCC Working Group 2, and Deborah Roberts, co-chair of IPCC Working Group 2. Uh, we're now going to present the, um, the report to you. And then, of course, we'll be happy to take your questions and, um, and reply to them. If uh, you're following this uh, presentation on the live stream, you can pose questions remotely. Go to slido, sli.do, and enter the event code SROCK, S-R-O-C-C, and please give us your name and organization for any questions. So with that, I'll hand over to Hui Sung, the, the chair of the IPCC. Thank you, Jonathan, for the introduction, and we are very happy to present you this, the outcome of this very sp important special report on oceans and cryosphere and the changing climate. And uh, you, have, you have, have the uh, front and back cover of this report, and uh, it is very significant that this front and back cover of the report pays tribute to the various regions addressed in this assessment from the poles to the tropics. The ocean and cryosphere, the frozen parts of the planet, might feel very remote to some people, but they impact all of us for weather, climate, food and water, for energy, trans trade and transport, for health and well-being, for culture and identity. The ocean and the cryosphere are critical for all life on Earth. All this report has shown that if greenhouse gas emissions continue to increase, global warming will drastically alter the ocean and the cryosphere. However, if we reduce emissions sharply, consequences for people and their livelihoods will still be challenging, but they will be potentially more manageable for those who are most vulnerable. The report reveals the benefits of ambitious and effective adaptation for sustainable development. Conversely, there may be escalating costs and risks associated with delayed action. Our bureau members and also uh, co-chairs has done a great deal of work to produce this report. I'm very happy to hand over our vice chair, Co. Barrett, for the next segment of our report. 
I think, I think Abdullah's going to do the next presentation. Ah, I'm sorry, so, Abdullah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Chair. The launch of the IPCC special report on ocean and cryosphere on changing climates is the conclusion of two years of hard work. The commissioning of this report came from government proposals, including the one coming from our generous host, the Principality of Monaco. This report built on the completion of the previous, two previous special reports, special reports on global warming of 1.5 degrees C and special report on climate change and land. Together, these three special reports built and chose the most and marked the most intensive and ambitious period of IPCC 30 year history. These three special reports will build a foundation for the upcoming work of the sixth assessment cycle as well as the scientific report. This latest report was written by 104 authors coming from 36 countries. 19 are coming from developing country and economy and transition, more than half. 31 of the authors are women. What, is, what about the science base? More than 7,000 scientific publications were referenced in this report. And this report was improved thanks to more than 31,000 review comments received from experts as well as government. Now I am pleased to hand over to Ko. Thank you, Abdallah. This report is unique because for the first time the IPCC has produced an in-depth report examining the furthest corners of the Earth, from the highest mountains and remote polar regions to the deepest oceans. We have found that even, and especially in these places, human-caused climate change is evident. This report documents the melting of high mountain glaciers and polar ice sheets which contain the fresh water for our future. It documents the thawing of permafrost, which is the frozen foundation for communities and wildlife habitats of the north. It shines a light on coastal and low-lying areas where sea level rise and associated impacts threaten the lives and livelihoods of large segments of our population. And it documents the ways in which the ocean has been acting like a sponge, absorbing carbon dioxide and heat to regulate the temperature. But it can't keep up. Taken together, these changes show that the world's ocean and cryosphere have been taking the heat for climate change for decades. The consequences for nature and humanity are sweeping and severe. This report highlights also the urgency of timely, ambitious, coordinated, and enduring action. What is at stake is the health of ecosystems, wildlife, and importantly, the world we leave for our children. Now I'd like to turn uh, to the co-author, the co-chairs, who will take you into a deeper dive to the findings of the report. Pam Mao, I turn to you. Thank you, Co. Melting glaciers Snow and ice in mountain regions are very visible symbols of climate change. A total of 670 million people live in high mountain regions. They are increasingly exposed to hazards and changes in water availability. Glaciers, snow, ice, and permafrost are declining, and we continue to do so. Smaller glaciers, such as in Europe, Eastern Africa, 
the tropical Andes and the Indonesia are projected to lose more than 8% of their current ice mass by 2100 if emissions continue to increase strongly. As glaciers retreat and the snow cover shrinks, warm adapted plant and animal species migrate upslope. This change, species richness, warm adapted species increase, cold and the snow adapted species decrease or eventually face extinction, especially without conservation. The retreat of high mountain cryosphere will continue to adversely affect recreational activities, tourism, and the cultural assets. What is more, the retreat of great glaciers and the thawing permafrost increases hazards for people live in those regions. For example, through landslides, arvaches, and the floods. Changes in water availability for households, agriculture, and energy will not just affect people in these high mountain regions, but also communities much further downstream. Limiting warming would help people to adjust to change in water supplies and the limits, risks related to mountain hazards. Integrated water management and the transboundary cooperation provide opportunities to address impacts of these changes in water resources. Now I move from high mountain to polar region and over to my fellow co-chair, Valerie Masson Dermot. Thank you, my friend Pan Mao. Changes in polar regions influence people's life around the world, wherever they live. The Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets are increasingly losing mass. These ice sheets, together with glacier melt, are now the dominant drivers of sea level rise, in addition to the expansion of warming seawater. Because ice sheets will continue to melt in response to past and current warming, the planet will experience global sea level rise for decades and centuries to come. Arctic sea ice is declining in every month of the year and is getting thinner. If global warming is stabilized at 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, the Arctic Ocean would be ice-free in September, the month with the least ice, only once in every 100 years. But for global warming of 2 degrees, this would occur up to one year in three. Permafrost, frozen soil and rock, is thawing with the potential of adding more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Even if global warming is limited to well below two degrees, around one quarter of the near surface permafrost will thaw by 2100. If our greenhouse gas emissions continue to increase strongly, around 70% near surface permafrost could be lost. People living in the Arctic, especially indigenous peoples, are already adjusting their travel and hunting activities to the seasonality and safety of land, ice, and snow conditions. But their success in adapting depends on funding, capacities, and institutional support. Four million people live permanently in the Arctic region. And small island developing states are home to 65 million people. 60, 680 million people live in low-lying coastal zones, and this will increase to a, mil a billion people by 2050. They are vulnerable to sea level rise and coastal extreme events. During the 20th century, the global mean sea level rose by about 15 centimeters. It's currently rising more than twice as fast, and the pace will further accelerate, reaching up to 1.10 meters in 2100 in projections, if emissions are not sharply reduced. Sea level rise will also increase the frequency of extreme sea level events, which occur, for instance, during high tides and intense storms. 
many low-lying coastal cities and small islands, as well as deltas, will be exposed to risks of flooding and land loss annually by 2050. Without major investments in adaptation, they would be exposed to escalating flood risks. So what can communities and cities at the coast do to adapt? The scientific literature addresses various adaptation approaches, including protection, for instance, with dikes, accommodation with flood-prone buildings and early warning systems, the importance of conservation and restoration of wetlands and coral reefs for ecosystem-based adaptation, coastal advance, and planned relocation is if safe alternative localities are available. The report notes that people with the highest exposure and vulnerability are often those with lowest capacity to respond. And we are now moving from coasts to ocean with my fellow coacher and friend Hans. Thank you, Valerie. Marine life is already being affected by warming and changes in ocean chemistry, which impacts on the people that depend on it. To date, the ocean has absorbed 90% of the heat in the climate system. It will take up two to four times more heat than between 1970 and the present by 2100, if global warming is limited to two degrees and up to five to seven times more at higher emissions. Warming in the ocean reduces mixing between water layers and therefore limits the supply of oxygen and nutrients for marine life. Marine heat waves have doubled in frequency since 1982 and are increasing in intensity. They are projected to further increase in frequency, duration, extent, and intensity. Their frequency will be 20 times higher at two degrees warming compared to pre-industrial levels. They would occur 50 times more often if emissions continue to increase strongly. They are especially harming warm water calls, kelp forests, and the distribution of marine life. By absorbing human-induced carbon emissions, the ocean is becoming more acidified. This is already making it harder for some marine species to build their shells and skeletons. The ocean has taken up between 20 to 30 percent of these carbon dioxide emissions, reducing global warming and continued uptake will exacerbate ocean acidification by 2100. An ocean that is warmer, more acidified, and losing oxygen has implications for marine life, its distribution, and productivity. Changes in the ocean cause shift, shifts in the distribution of fish population. This has reduced the global catch potential in the fisheries. In the future, some regions, notably tropical oceans, will see further decreases, but there will be increases in others, such as the Arctic, at least transiently. Communities that depend highly on seafood may face risks to nutritional health and food security. In addition to cutting greenhouse gas emissions, reducing other pressures such as pollution will further help marine life deal with changes in their environment. Policy frameworks such as fisheries management and marine protected areas offer opportunities for people to adapt to changes and minimize risks for our livelihoods while enabling a more resilient ocean. And with that, I hand over to my fellow co-chair, Deborah Roberts. Thanks so much, Hans. What we see is that human-induced climate change has a major footprint on the systems we depend on, from the top of the mountains to the depth of the ocean. 
these changes will continue for generations to come. This new IPCC special report highlights the urgency of prioritizing timely, ambitious, and coordinated action to address widespread and enduring changes in the ocean and cryosphere. It provides the best available scientific knowledge to empower people, communities, and governments to tackle the unprecedented transitions in all aspects of society, including energy, land and ecosystems, urban and infrastructure, as well as industry, that would be needed to deliver on the Paris Agreement. The report gives evidence of the benefits of combining scientific with local and indigenous knowledge to develop, to develop suitable options to manage climate change risks and enhance resilience. This is the first IPCC report that highlights the importance of education to enhance climate change, ocean, and cryosphere literacy. The more decisively and earlier we act, the more able we will be to address unavoidable changes, manage risks, improve our lives, achieve sustainability for ecosystems and people around the world, both today and in the future. And with that, I'll hand the mic back to Jonathan. Thank, thank you, Deborah. So that, that completes our, our presentation, and we will now move on to the, the Q&A. So, we, uh, besides people in the room, we're also offering the possibility for, for those of you watching the, the presentation on live stream to, to ask questions remotely. You go to sli.do and enter the event code SROCK, S-R-O-C-C. So, but first of all, are there any questions from people here? Um, yeah, in the, by the gangway there, in the fifth or sixth row. And please say who you are. And, uh... Uh, Mark Phillips from CBS News. Uh, is it a fair characterization of this report to say that with respect to the consequences of climate change, it's no longer a question of if or when, but how much, how bad it will be? Hans, do you want to start with that and then uh, Valerie, yeah. maybe? I'm, I'm happy to, to address it. Yes, this is certainly a correct characterization. From the point of view of science, there's no doubt about climate change to happen, about its consequences. And here we are dealing with, a, with three quarters to 80% of the globe and its, its surface. And these systems are changing. And these far-reaching consequences can only be brought under control by acute emissions reductions. Yeah. Yeah. Valerie? Yes, the, the, the report highlights what is already ongoing, that is already in many places unprecedented, and it highlights the scale of escalating change that could happen but will depend strongly on emissions of greenhouse gases in the next decades. Deborah? I think while that's an important message, um, another important message to emerge, though, is that we can act and that we can act at scale. And that, to me, is the most important advancement of this report, not harking on the fact that we have climate change that will impact on us, but the fact that we need to mobilize at scale, work together to pull resource, resources at multiple levels across scales. That, to me, is an important message as well. Thank you. I have a question here from Seth Borenstein of the Associated Press. The IPCC has been issuing reports for decades how would you rate the urgency of this assessment compared to past ones? Is this the most urgent yet? And do you feel that policymakers are listening to you since emissions continue to rise and the issues aren't being tackled? So I think many of you will want to jump in on that. Yeah, hands first. Yeah, maybe to start the discussion of this very point, it is very clear that society ours is now um, receiving the message more strongly than ever before and especially the young generation is picking, picking up this message because they see the future and, and the future of the world that should still be there for them to deliver the services that it currently still does. And they are concerned. 
they, have, they are building their concern and expressions of their concern on the signs that they have heard about from the IPCC assessments, especially since the release of the 1.5 report, then with the land report, and now certainly this one covers the largest dimensions of, of the globe and the interdependencies of, of the systems that, that we have been uh, looking at. So the message is, is received and um, society and policy um, have the choices in hand uh, to take rapid action as needed to keep those uh, changes under control. Perfect. Thanks, Hans. Valerie and then Co, please. I think this report is unprecedented in um, flagging the importance of using scientific information on trends to come um, to build adaptation. It highlights choices for adaptation, but also some limits, both for ecosystems and societies. It also, I think it's also a report to empower people to act uh, by bringing together scientific knowledge, local knowledge. People in communities know better what they can do, and indigenous knowledge, which we sure is critical for adaptation. And I'll, I'll just add that I find this report to be unprecedented in the sense that it provides this complete picture of changes to water on the planet, from the highest mountain glaciers in polar regions to the depths of the ocean, and the interconnectedness of the way that this water flows and um, impacts people all through those systems and, frankly, all across the world. Because, as we all know, water is the lifeblood of the planet. And the changes that are highlighted in this report have uh, effects for um, everyone. Yeah. Huisen? I'd like to highlight that, that we do have a con very consistent message to uh, give uh, right from our first special report on 1.5 and the land and this uh, oceans and cryosphere report. That is that we are in the race uh, between two factors. One is the um, uh, human ecosystem's capacity to adapt, and the other one is the, the speed of impact of climate change. And uh, this report, as well as the land report, indicates that we may be losing in this race. And therefore, the message is that right from the first re special report on 1.5, we need to take immediate and drastic action to cut emissions right now, and especially right from the next year, if we want to achieve this carbon neutrality in the mid of this century. And that is the consistent message we found throughout our three special report. Thank you. Deborah? I think two important messages reinforced by this particular report is obviously the urgency um, of the climate change challenge we face, but linked to that, the urgency of action in response. And I think as Co indicated, this has provided a new perspective on the scale of action that is required. These systems are large, they're two important components of our climate system. They impact many people in places where they live. And this report gives us a real perspective on how we have to join up science with policy, with communities, with different forms of knowledge, new elements of responses to the challenge, new resources, to be able to respond to the urgent challenge in a way that provides urgent action, but importantly, at scale. And I think that's an important message from the report. Thank you. A question there in about the fourth row. Yeah, please, please, please say who you are. Thank you, uh, Marlo Hood from Agence France Presse. As this report is designed to advise policymakers, I wonder if you would comment on your decision to frame the report in terms of the two most extreme emission scenarios um, and why you chose not to include a more intermediate one, which uh, common sense might suggest would be closer to where we might wind up. That is RCP 2.6 and 8.5. Thank you. Valerie? So to explore plausible futures, um, climate scientists use scenarios, and the scenarios imply different development patterns. But in this report, we use scenarios of different changes in atmospheric composition, especially greenhouse gas concentration. It, the chapters of the report use available scientific information for many aspects of the physical changes, 
There is information using all the four radiative concentration pathway scenarios. But for some aspects, like ice sheet response impacts for um, the uh, fish catch potential, information in the scientific literature is sometimes restricted to scenarios of low emissions or high emissions. So the report is based on the evidence available in the scientific literature. Um, we just describe these as high or low emission futures. In the coming years, more um, pathways and scenarios will be available, including lower emission scenarios for which results were not available for this assessment. Thank you, Panma. There are also some uh, information uh, for other scenarios, uh, uh, for RCP uh, 4.5, RCP 6.0 uh, uh, in the underlying report. But uh, they are not uh, you know, as much as uh, RCP 8.5, RCP 2.6, which have more literature reflected. And also, the impact will be in between these two extreme cases. Thank you. I have a question from Chris Haslam of the Sunday Times. What evidence is there now that Caribbean hurricanes will become more frequent and more powerful as a result of anthropogenic climate change? More, more powerful, but maybe you could answer more intense as well. Yeah, Valerie. So this report has a chapter dedicated to extreme events and abrupt change. In that chapter, it's the first time an IPCC report is assessing literature related to the link between our emissions of greenhouse gases and the characteristics of individual extreme weather events. So the report shows that there's growing scientific evidence that our emissions of greenhouse gases have altered the characteristics of extreme events such as tropical cyclones, including the intensity of heavy rainfall or precipitation rates, and the intensity of wind. And it confirms earlier findings from past reports um, of increased storm surges in a warming climate, especially due to the effect of a rising mean sea level in addition to the occurrence of cyclones. Thank you, Valerie. Any, any questions in the room right now? There at the back. Please, please identify yourself. Um, Carla Castel from SIC Television in Portugal. May we have already passed the tipping point of abrupt and irreversible change and not knowing it yet? I, I didn't hear that. Could you repeat it? Yes. May we have already Pass the tipping point of irre irreversible change and the abrupt change, and uh, the scientists not knowing it yet, not having the data to know the tipping point has already been passed. Yeah, your hands, please. Certainly, you are right that there are large uncertainties about tipping points that may still be ahead of us. But for some systems, especially biological systems in the oceans, we have already evidence that the tipping point has been passed. Just think about the warm water corals and the coral reefs, which are already in decline and, and uh, which are surpassing uh, their tolerance threshold with every exposure to a marine heat wave. And the frequency of marine heat waves is increasing uh, re reducing their capacity and strongly their capacity um, to, to recover. So you, it depends really on the system that you are looking at um, and its, its current characteristic uh, tick, tipping point in, in question. So we have evidence for those and certainly there are tipping points in the climate system that are also important that my fellow coaches might be able to comment on. Thank you. To Deborah, then Valerie. I think it's important that we also consider the relational aspects of this report. Hans has called out the fact that there are certainly potential changes in the natural system, but those are linked back in the report to the changes that has for society. And the report calls out very strongly that for certain societies around the world and areas where they are highly exposed to impacts such as sea level rise and extreme events, 
This could create real vexing questions, difficult questions about the habitability of some areas of the world. So I think we need to look at changes in the natural system, but also in terms of impacts that this will have on communities and economies around the world. Yeah, Valerie? Yes, I would like to speak about irreversible change. In this report, irreversible means changes that will not be possible to be avoided on time scales of centuries. And um, climate change is already irreversible due to the heat uptake in the ocean. We can't go back. Whatever we do with our emissions, climate change is already irreversible. The report provides evidence for accelerated ice sheet flow in two sectors in Antarctica, in West and Antarctic um, ice sheet sectors. And it says it might be the onset of irreversible change based on evidence we have at the moment. The report shows the potential of permafrost thaw to release large amounts of greenhouse gases, but at the moment, we cannot conclude whether the current permafrost thaw is releasing net emissions to the atmosphere due to limited evidence. And the report shows that there's a weakening of the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. There is no formal attribution to our greenhouse gas emissions in the literature, but in climate models, in historical simulations with more greenhouse gas emissions, um, this is a pattern seen in climate models. So this is the new evidence we provide in the report, and it's different from previous assessments because there's new knowledge on these changes. Thank you, and this is possibly a related question. But with melting glaciers and other white bodies, when will we hit a tipping point that means the resulting negative impact from the reduced albedo effect locks us into a global warming scenario beyond 1.5 degrees? That was from David O'Flynn. Sorry. With melting glaciers and other white bodies, when will we hit a tipping point that means the resulting negative impact from the reduced albedo effect locks us into a global warming scenario beyond 1.5 degrees? Valerie? I'm not sure I've correctly heard, um, due to hearing challenges, the question. I understand it's related to the shrinking cryosphere and albedo effects. So let me talk about the Arctic sea ice. The Arctic sea ice is uh, thinning and shrinking, especially in summer, but also during all months. Um, in a warmer world, um, there will be further retreat of the Arctic sea ice. And uh, due to the loss of the mirror effect of the ice, together with the loss of the mirror effect of the reduced snow cover, this leads to amplified warming in the Arctic, about twice the global average. For the Arctic sea ice, it's not associated with irreversibility in that as soon as you can stabilize warming, you can stop the shrinking of the Arctic sea ice cover. Thank you. Another question from outside the room from Megan, uh, Megan Rowling of the Thomson Reuters Foundation. Are there predictions in this report about the number of people who could be displaced from coastal areas by sea level rise? If so, what are they? And if not, what is the message we should take from this report about displacement risks due to changes in sea level and weather patterns? <laughs> that's, that's you, yeah. Certainly the report gives the numbers of people affected, consider the 65 million people in small island states, consider the 680 million people living in coastal areas, and especially, certainly not all of them, but especially those people living close to low-lying uh, coastal areas, close to deltas or in deltas, they are um, under challenge of rising sea level al already uh, today, and there are um, need to exploit the different measures of adaptation that has been uh, listed on, on one of uh, the slides. So these challenges are developing, and certainly these people are also at risk of being exposed to these extreme sea level events where the, the rise in average sea level is combined with the increasing storm surges and wave heights that would also threaten uh, these areas. Thank you, Valerie. I know the media are really attracted by these numbers, but the underlying report shows how much um, the effects on people depend on adaptation. And for instance, one of the key figures of the summary for policymakers 
shows the scale of risk for different adaptation levels. And so, in result, displacement of people really depends on choices to be made and adaptation solutions that are available or not for people. Thank you. Anything else in the room at the moment? Uh, yep, a uh, lady in the seventh, yeah. eighth row by the aisle. Too late. There, please. And please identify yourself. You are now a German news agency, DPA. Um, I have a question. There was just a climate summit in New York at the United Nations. Do you feel that the action taken by politicians is enough, that there is enough effort? What is your feeling towards that? Certainly the IPCC does not uh, sit in judgment on, on the action of world leaders, but I think the fact that this report was called for and was released timelessly to inform the decisions that will flow from those discussions at the, the climate summit is an important indication of the extent to which science is becoming central to taking key decisions about choosing pathways to a more sustainable future, a world that's safer, and more equitable. So I think the congruence in terms of having the summit and the release of this report indicates that this is the right time for this report to enter into the significant policy negotiations that must surely flow from con the convening of the summit in New York. Thank you, Co. And I'll just add that the events uh, surrounding the, um, the gathering in New York have certainly demonstrated groundswell of action across the world, and uh, particularly by youth, that have uh, very much been uh, supported uh, by the science that we and others provide. Thank you, Valerie. Yes, I just wanted to flag that the global emissions of the key greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide are going up, and that's the key message from scientific observations. Efficient action is expected to lead to uh, reaching a peak as soon as possible and then a decrease. There are many regions of the world, uh, cities, countries, where action is being taken. It shows you can build development, improve well-being of people while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It shows it's possible, but the challenge is taking action at the scale and fast enough at the global level. Thank you. Hoysen? There are various uh, wonderful uh, adaptation measures uh, to be applicable in this changing in this uh, climate change in this world of climate change, such as ecosystem-based adaptation or blue carbon system, etc. But those systems can be applicable only under a changing global, a changing uh, global warming less than 1.5 or less, much less than 2 degrees uh, Celsius, which implies that the world needs to take an immediate drastic reduction of, of greenhouse gas warming. And uh, we believe that that is the message the scientific community has given to the world consistently throughout these assessments. Thank you. Question from uh, Mar Gomez of El Tiempo in Spain. This report highlights the climatic urgency of the ocean. Has it been quantified which regions may be most affected in economic losses to social impact in the world by losses in fishing and way of life? I think that's Hans. Certainly we are not yet there that we can give a comprehensive overview of economic effects in the different regions, but what we can say is that the most vulnerable people are living in, in the developing countries, especially at, at low latitudes. Those that depend on, for example, artisanal fisheries in the area where we have the, the warm water uh, coral reefs and their fish stocks are feeding uh, a large percentage of, of the relevant uh, population. And certainly an important insight from, the last, uh, from one of the last reports uh, was that, that over time paying for climate-related damages is much more, it's several fold more expensive than increasing investment into uh, renewables, into technologies that support rapid reduction of, of emissions. And, and considering this comparison, 
should be a strong motivation to find the right path into the future. Thank you. Uh, Deborah, then Valerie. But I think that's why the report stresses that our levels of action need to occur not only in terms of addressing the climate change challenge, but in building societal resilience. So our actions to deal with impacts on the fisheries, rising sea levels, are as important as the need to ensure that we have social safety nets for poor and disadvantaged communities, that they have access to things such as early warning systems. So again, this the report speaks to us across a variety of needs, not only to deal with the changes in the physical and natural systems that surround us, but to fundamentally change our societies, the way we redistribute resources, the way we use our combined power to assist those who are more vulnerable than ourselves. Thank you, Valerie. Yes, it's just to flag that in terms of decision making, the report highlights the importance of including information on changes in the ocean and cryosphere, in general climate change and impacts, in economic information as well. And there are gaps there. Um, in some economic model projections, it's still hard to include um, the consequences and cascading effects of changes in the ocean and cryosphere. Thank you. Any, anything else in the room at the moment? There's one at the back there, please. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and please identify yourself. Yeah. I'm Lavinia Leal from RTP, uh, Portuguese television. I want to know if um, uh, preserve the, the ocean ecosystems uh, is the key to decelerate the global warming. warming. And uh, if you think that a global threat can make a difference. So we didn't we didn't quite hear the question. Could you repeat it slowly and <laughs> the you got it? Yeah. Sorry. That is that is a very uh, relevant. Oh, okay. Uh, I uh, I want to know if preserve the oceans uh, is the key to decelerate the global warming. And if uh, you think that a global ocean threat can make a difference. Um, we are certainly, and we can only emphasize again and again that the global ocean by covering more than 70% of the global surface, the surface and by delivering all these services both locally and globally plays such an important role in the climate system and, and, and also in the services to, to humankind. This um, goes from looking at, at the coast where the preservation and conservation of, of uh, coastal protection systems like the warm water coral reefs, like the mangrove forests, and also considering their capacity to store carbon and, and conserve it in that place over time are very important also in the global carbon balance. And then the biological pump in the ocean is, is very Im important for, for securing the uptake and storage of carbon in the ocean. Fish stocks, if they are, can be maintained at a high level, are also an important element in, in carbon storage. All of this insight is incomplete yet, but we, we know the direction in which it is going, indicating that conservation and marine protection areas, the building of a network of marine protection areas is the way forward to uh, ensure that the ocean's uh, contribution to, to a sustainable world will be maintained. And certainly we are deficient in international regulation systems that make sure that that the international coordination works efficiently towards uh, such uh, the establishment of such a, a system. There's, there are deficiencies and there is a need to improve on, on those systems. 
So Isn't yes, right? uh, a very strong yes in reply uh, to your answer, but this is certainly not the complete global picture. Land systems, and we've learned that from the last report, also can make a very strong contribution and are equally important. Thank you, Valerie, then Deborah. Yes, just three points from the report. The report flags the importance of networks of protected marine areas to help maintain ecosystems and their services for us, including carbon uptake and storage. It flags the importance of the restoration of marine habitats, but the potential to preserve ecosystems can be limited. For instance, coral reef restoration could be ineffective under high levels of global warming due to the high risks for these fragile ecosystems. It also shows the importance of the restoration of vegetated coastal ecosystems, mangroves, uh, seagrass, meadows, wetlands, tidal marshes. They, call, they are known as blue carbon ecosystems. And such actions at the global scale could uh, uh, increase the equivalent of carbon uptake and storage of about half a percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. So there's a true potential here, but you can't believe that um, protection of uh, marine ecosystems is enough, given the scale of our current greenhouse gas emissions, reaching something like 40 billion tons CO2 emitted in the atmosphere per year. The key to protect marine life is to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible at an important pace. So Deborah and Panel. Well, the report obviously acknowledges the importance of government action, and within that context, a treaty would be important. That certainly doesn't offer us the entire solution because the report calls out very strongly that we need action across all elements of society. So it calls out very strongly the importance of governance where all aspects of society from local communities through to cities all the way through to national governments are acting. And that means that we need to draw more people to the table than we've had before. A treaty will draw governments to the table but we need to access indigenous knowledge, local knowledge. We need to have communities at the table who experience these impacts and can enable a new discussion. So I think a treaty might be one element in our toolbox, but probably a more important intervention is finding new mechanisms that allow us to access local level knowledge, allow us to draw that up to the national level and provide the opportunity for different actors to begin to sit at the table to help us decide the future of these important systems. Yeah, Panna. Uh, what I want to stress is the ocean is uh, under very heavy burden now. More than 90% of human-induced heat have been taken up here by the ocean. And uh, uh, they say, personally, I feel they automatic the, 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 the only solution, you know, is to cut the emissions quickly and deeply. That, that may be the only solution. Or the other ways we only can adapt to it, but you, to think the ocean is get warmer and warmer and uh, get, uh, you know, become more and more acid and the ecosystem is influenced by the by by, by the, 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 the global warming and the, the climate change. So that's a very serious situation. Thank you. And Hans again, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I would just like to add the thought that the pathway of emissions reduction, and this is a message from this report together with the two previous report, should be understood as a guardrail for us, as a firm principle that societies um, should, should consider in their policies. There is also uh, the, the aspect of transformation, the change in, in how we use energy the, and, and how we exploit energy resources and uh, how, we, how we travel, how we live and, and so forth. And, and clearly, the positive news is that with rapid transformation, as Deborah has indicated, to ways to do the same things differently, to use renewable fuels, to re use renewable energy. If this transformation is happening and successful on short timescales, the less we need to constrain our, constrain our modes of life in order to keep to the pathways that have been laid out, out to us in order to reach 
and, and limit the degree of, of reach the climate targets and, and limit the degree of global warming. Thank you very much, Hans. And unfortunately, we have to draw to a close now. Um, so th thank you, thank you very much, the panel, and thank you very much for your questions. We, a lot of interesting questions have been posed, um, but we haven't had a chance to answer. But there'll be other opportunities to do that, not least when we present this report and our other products at COP25 in Chile in a, in a couple of months' time. Um, so, hope to see you there. Thank you very much. We'd like to thank His Serene Highness for honoring us with his presence today. And after the press conference, perhaps you'd have time for a quick uh, family photo with our panel. So, thank you very much and see you again soon.